Thank you so much for joining us for yet another episode of Holding Court, our Patreon-backed interview episodes. And guys, I am thrilled to be joined by Sarah Erickson from Renegade Games, my former boss. <laughs> I don't know if I'd go that far. <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe not. So uh, for folks who don't know, Sarah and I worked together at, at Gen Con. I would not have been at Gen Con without Sarah's help. And Sarah, in general, is an awesome person who uh, we've dealt with quite a bit in the context of the Dukes. Sarah, how are you doing this fine Sunday when we're recording? Oh, it's wonderful. The sun is out. It's a brisk 36 degrees here in Bozeman, Montana, so it's perfect. 36 degrees? Wow. It's, uh, it's about 73 here in St. Louis right now. So, man, 36 degrees. Yeah, it's nice. <laughs> I wouldn't have it any other way. <laughs> <sighs> <laughs> and you're stuck inside talking to me. That's Bummer. okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so for folks who don't know, Sarah, um, get, run us through the background. When did you first get into to hobby games? Well, that's a good question. So I really started playing board games with my family as a very small child. I even had a class once where I had to make my own board games. So it's always been part of my life. But as far as hobby games go, I really was introduced to Magic the Gathering as many of us were in about 2000 when it became an online game. I've always really liked video games too. So I played it as a video game, not as a card game. But after enjoying it so much, I did eventually get into the physical game as well. Played a little bit of Sellers of Catan and sort of light other hobby games. And then eventually my husband and I actually bought an existing hobby store. And we really bought it as a business, not because we really loved games, but because it seemed like something we could do and it could be an actual job for my husband. So we jumped into that and haven't looked back. What were you doing before that? So I had, we had actually both just graduated from college and I was working as a pulmonary immunologist in a research lab and doing vaccine research, but he was sort of bouncing around to a few different jobs that were all at weird times of day and it was hard for us to spend time together. So the store offered us an opportunity to do something actually together because I could be there in the evenings and help him work and we could talk about it on the weekends and his hours were a little bit more reasonable although we were working a lot at least they were together so that was good and a lot less driving and that kind of stuff. Well it sounds like you were still maybe doing some of the the pulmonary immunologist uh, research work as well at the same time? Yeah I did that for several years until it got to the point where it was pretty clear we needed a manager and it seemed like more fun to do that than myself than to pay somebody basically what I was being paid at the lab to work at our store instead. So I jumped ship and changed my career path a little bit. I didn't realize it was going to be a lifelong change, but I'm happy with that. The game industry is just such a wonderful place to be. It's been really fun. What was it? What were the early days of that store like? Oh, man. <laughs> It's pretty embarrassing, really. We were really a shoestring project going on there. It was a very small store. We were about 800 square feet. And as I mentioned, it was an existing business, which made it a little bit easier, but it wasn't going great when we bought it. So my husband's great at money and economics and really is a hard worker. So he did a great job of doing the day-to-day -day stuff and managing all of the finances. And then I did a lot of the customer service face-to-face, -face, just getting the community going type stuff. So between the two of us, it was lucky we really had the different skills that we needed to fill in the, the holes and make it work. But it really took both of us working all the time to make it happen. And eventually we were able to move into a larger location and that worked out for a couple of years until we outgrew that one. And now we're in our third location, which is about 5,300 square feet. So it's a pretty large store, especially for a small place like Bozeman. No kidding. What were, what were some of those early changes that you guys would, would have to make as, as, as try to transition that into a successful business? Um, one thing that we did was just really paid attention to our community and what they wanted because every evening we'd have events and in a very small space we had to really change the entire layout of our store literally every evening to accommodate the different events that were happening whether that was a miniatures game or card games or board games every one of those groups needed a different setup so we put everything in our store on wheels so we could move it away from the middle of the store we had different tabletops that we could put onto our regular standard size tables 
to make it easier. My husband even custom built this really crazy table that was like a piece of origami that folded out to be a bigger table when we needed it to be. It was super cool. <laughs> so, <laughs> awesome. Yeah, so we really paid attention to what people were excited about. And I think that that's still something that our store is pretty good at doing because every store that's a hobby store has these different communities and they need to change as those communities change, whether that's because a new type of managers game came along and it's just really blowing up in your store, or maybe TCGs aren't really as big as they used to be. You need to be able to accommodate the people that you do have and make fun events for them. You can't just do the exact same things you did 10 years ago because it's a different world out there now, especially with board games just being such a big deal. They take a lot of different space and a lot of different needs than your regular TCG or miniatures player. What's the biggest lesson you learned or the biggest misstep you might have had in, in some of those early days as you guys were really figuring this thing out? I think one of the maybe biggest challenges has always been finding the right employees. And it's tough because we are still just a really small local business. So paying people huge amounts of money just isn't really possible. So we've had a tough time trying to balance finding really great employees with ones that are dedicated to being able to work in this really fun environment without getting paid a whole lot for it. And especially in a college town, we have a ton of turnover. So we have eventually where we're at now, we've had some pretty good long-term employees, but it's always a challenge. People kind of grow up and realize that they want to have a career and working in retail is not something that everybody really wants to do for the rest of their lives. So that can be a big challenge. I think that's probably something a lot of stores face. What was the thing that surprised you most? About owning a store? Yeah. Um, I think that maybe the biggest surprise to me was how awesome the community is. Because at every stage in our store, we've had people who just care about us so much that they would do practically anything to keep our store going. And luckily, we've never been in a situation where we really needed that. But there have been times like there was somebody walking around the store one evening when I was there at the counter and he had this game underneath his arm and he was just sort of walking around thinking about what he, what he wanted to buy and he realized that he had left his wallet in the car. So not thinking about it, he starts walking out of the store with this game under his arm and I sort of make a motion like, hey guy, you need to pay for that. And mm. one of my customers who was in the back just playing games saw this whole thing happening, thought this guy was trying to rob our store and almost attacked him. Oh man. <laughs> <laughs> I felt kind of bad for the poor guy who was just forgetful, but it was very interesting and very cool to see how much loyalty there was. And I think that it's because we're a community and we're that third space that people need to spend time at to get away from their job and their house and regular life. And I didn't really think about that before we started the store, how important that space was for people, but it definitely has been for me. So it makes sense that it would be important for our customers as well. What is it that you think that, that the typical board game consumer most misunderstands about the retail side of things? Oh, I think that the whole entire process is a little bit vague to people. I think some of that is becoming a little more obvious because of Kickstarters. They're getting to see a lot more of the back end process. But I think maybe what's still not clear to people is how pricing happens. So when we, as a manufacturer, make a game, we need to make some money on it. We sell it to a distributor, they need to make some money on it. It goes all the way down the chain through the retailer. And so everybody is taking a little cut and making that game kind of a little bit more expensive as it goes. Kickstarter is weird because it takes the game straight from the manufacturer, the publisher of the game to the consumer. And so because you cut out some middlemen, there's obviously not as many price jumps. But it also means that you can't get those games in front of as many people because only a small amount of people realistically are actually using Kickstarter. So it's tough because I really want to be able to support retail stores like my own as a publisher, but it means that games are maybe a little bit more expensive. But in the end, it's worth it because you're paying for, again, this community space that you're getting. So I think that pricing is something that a lot of consumers just don't really have a good handle on where those numbers come from and what they mean. But I do think that's getting a little bit better. People are sort of figuring that out. What kind of effect do the, the big online retailers, your Cool Stuff Inks, your, your miniature markets have on, on those friendly local game stores, on those local retailers? Uh, from, from your side of it, has it, has it helped, hurt, 
Uh, has it has it proved tricky? I, I know certainly on pricing, I can imagine it th- certainly throws folks for a loop. Oh, it absolutely has changed the way that we need to think about what we're ordering in our store, whether that's just moving more of our sales to smaller games where the price difference isn't as much, or whether it's, you know, backing Kickstarter projects as a retail store. We definitely have made some changes in what we purchase and where we're looking to make our money and stay afloat. And I think that one of the other big surprises for me has definitely been that we're seeing a lot of people say, I know I can get this cheaper online, but I do want to support my local store. I want you guys to be here in 20 years so that my kids can come and play too. So that's been really gratifying, but I want to be competitive as much as possible. I want to offer my customers as much as I can. So we try and be as price sensitive without being too crazy and still staying in business. It's a tough line to to follow. So I don't know where that's gonna go. It's definitely something that's changing our industry though. And not just in our industry, pretty much everything that used to be only retail and now people can buy online, those things are turning into commodities where they used to be you know, specialty items that you could only get at this one place. Now you can get that same thing anywhere on the internet and the price should be the same everywhere. So that's just a big economic change that a lot of industries are going through. No doubt about it. So how do you get more onto the publisher side of things? Uh, from, from at least looking at the, the wonderful press release on Renegade Games' website, uh, <laughs> Wizards of the Coast was the, was the first stop as far as that, that's concerned. Yeah, I started volunteering for them, uh, geez, I think it was about six or seven years ago now. I just saw an advertisement on their website saying they were looking for people to help out at conventions, and I thought that sounded like something interesting that I could do, and I was still working at the lab at the time, so I thought it would be kind of fun to just do something a little bit different. I love Wizards of Coast products and magic, so I filled out the application and they called me up and asked me if I wanted to go to South by Southwest with them, which is a really strange place for them to go (laughs) because it's not really, at (laughs) least back then, it definitely did not have a gamer part of it at all. And so we were in this sort of uh, convention warehouse type space with no (laughs) carpet or anything. And the booth next to us was rock band. So we were trying to teach people how to play magic while there's rock band right next to us. And it was tricky because we were in Texas and magic was not as big of a deal as it is now, although it was still a pretty big thing. And people legitimately didn't understand the difference between poker and a trading card game. So teaching them magic for days and days was such an exciting experience because it's just such a different world that they'd never been exposed to before. So that was really fun. And I was lucky enough that they invited me back a few more times. And eventually, after I'd volunteered for them quite a bit, I also saw a similar posting for Cryptozoic Entertainment. And I'd been playing the World of Warcraft trading card game quite a bit too and Mm. demoing that at my store and had a great community for it. So I jumped on board with one of their big tournaments right when Cryptozoic started after they took over the license from Upper Deck. And I was able to go down to one of their big events in Las Vegas and help them run a huge tournament, which was amazing. And then eventually they asked if I wanted to come on as their retailer coordinator. So helping stores run organized play tournaments and get set up with their programs. And I actually moved to California for a year to do that and then moved back to Montana, but kept my job. And yeah, that was pretty exciting. I guess after that, I then worked for Yellow for a little while before um, working again for Scott Gaeta, who was one of the co-founders of Cryptozoic. When he started Renegade, he then again hired me. So that was pretty lucky. What were your first impressions of Scott when you when you met him at Cryptozoic? <laughs> Um, I don't remember exactly what our conversation was, but I met him at Gamma one year as a store owner, and I know that I was arguing with him about something. (laughs) I'm sure I was telling him that I wanted something to be a certain way, and I don't remember what it was. I'll have to ask and see if he remembers, but he came off as a very understanding and uh, easy listening kind of a guy. Like most of those conversations, I was just some annoying store owner that nobody wanted to listen to, but he actually took some time and, and wanted to hear what I had to say. So that was very much appreciated right from the bat. 
And then the other piece of that I noticed in, in sort of the background you were just telling, you, you were in California for a year. How tricky was that year for you? <laughs> Um, you know, honestly, it was a great experience because I've lived in either Idaho or Montana my whole life. So just going to a big city and seeing what that was like was a good experience. But it was hard because we kept the store. We kept our house. I still had my car up here. So we would not really cut the cord <laughs> because <laughs> we were not really sure how it would go. We just never lived anywhere like that. We never lived in an apartment. Honestly, my husband and I had always had roommates because he bought his first house at 19 and we'd always paid our mortgage by renting out rooms in our place. So it was the first First time we'd ever lived by ourselves, which was also kind of crazy. So it was definitely a transition. And there were a lot of things I liked about it. But it was really tough to be so far away from nature. We we're living in Orange County, which is a little different than other parts of Southern California. And it was really tough for us to not be able to just walk out our back door and be on a trail like we are here. So that was the biggest transition. Also working in an office, I'd worked in the lab before, but it's not really the same environment. It definitely is hard. I work from home now, which is nice because I don't get as distracted by all the other people. I know some people have a tough time working from home because they get distracted by Netflix or whatever else they have going on. But for me, it's kind of the opposite. So it it was a good time, but I'm glad to be back up here in Montana. Did you did you get a, a love for In and Out when you were when you were down there? <laughs> in and Out is fantastic. It's pretty tasty. <laughs> but my husband actually was a rancher. He grew up on a, a beef ranch, so he has his own fancy meat that he gets every week in the mail. So he likes that quite a bit. But In and Out Burger was good too. <laughs> fancy fancy mail meat. Okay, yes. <laughs> interesting. Huh? Yep. <laughs> Subscription meat box. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Uh, so so our, that actually brings us to our first question, which comes from Jeff Rademacher. And Jeff is curious, with you in Montana and Scott in California, how, what, what's, what are the pros and cons of, of that separation, of, of not being in the same place when you guys are coordinating a heck of a lot of stuff, especially with Renegade, as unbelievably hot as it is as a publisher? <laughs> Well, Jeff is very sweet to say so. I appreciate that. Um, you know, I added really... a lot of that, to be fair. Oh, okay. Okay, that's fair. <laughs> um, you know, it really is not that big of a deal because we have such amazing technology. Like you and I are chatting right now and we're not in the same place. So it doesn't really make a ton of difference except that it's easier for us to really focus and get our own stuff done without the distractions of an office. But every once in a while, it would be really nice to be in the same place, to be able to sit down and play a game and chat about whether or not we like it and what things we would change about it. So we do get to see each other pretty often when we travel to events. Um, Last year we had a little get together at Scott's house where several um, people from the industry, myself, um, my sister who does our customer service, we all went down to his house and played a lot of prototypes for the week and that was super helpful. So if we could do more of that, it would be nice. So it wouldn't hurt for us to be in the same place. But at the same time, technology makes it pretty easy for that to not be an issue. And it sounds like, especially given the community you've built, the kind of lifestyle you like to live, leaving Montana again might be a bit of a non-starter. It would be really tough. I love exploring. I love new adventures. So moving again would not be the end of the world, but I would sorely miss my board gaming group here. They're pretty amazing. I play games two to three times a week at least, and that's really nice to be able to be exposed to what else is in the industry. I think a lot of publishers have a tough time playing games that aren't their own simply because it takes so much time to do it, and I'm lucky enough to have a really fantastic board gaming group that teaches me games, and I can teach them games, and I see what they're excited about. And that really gives me a good perspective for the rest of the industry. Makes total sense. What are what are some favorites while while we're kind of on that? What are what are the the, the Sarah Erickson top five? Oh, you know, one game I've been playing a lot this year has been Anachrony. It's by Mind Clash Games. That is a brilliant game. I love the time travel aspect of it. I really like worker placement games. And I find it fascinating how much better that game is because it's got these huge clunky miniatures that don't do anything in the game. I don't know if you've played it, but... No, not yet. It's a worker placement game that you could easily, easily use small cardboard chits to just place them on the worker action spaces. 
but instead they made these really crazy huge miniatures and you take your worker that you want to put in that slot into the miniature you like stick it into the top of it so it, it pokes out it's really weird and then you take that whole thing and put it onto the action spaces and it's unreasonable how much more fun the game is when you play it with them because you don't have to like there's a whole pack that you can play just without them but I don't suggest it. <laughs> so that's what I've really enjoyed lately. Um, I've been playing honestly a lot of minute or a lot of uh, Renegade games because we have a lot coming out right now. So Ex Libris has hit the table a lot. Clank in Space has been really fun. So we've been doing a lot of that too. But definitely some non Renegade games as well. Hey, hey, easy with the plugs. Hey, <laughs> a little out of control there. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's all. It's all good. I, I was uh, just getting in for the first time because I'm, I'm starting to get introduced more to the games in our line, and we'll, we'll be talking marketing here in, in short order, but I uh, got in uh, Study in Emerald recently, second edition, and that was my first time actually playing that and, and had a pretty good experience with it. But because of the podcast and whatnot, full disclosure, hey, you, you want to try not to plug this stuff too much. Anyway, that's just on me. That's, <laughs> yep. that's just the tricky, <laughs> tricky tangled role I have to try and, to try and navigate. Uh, so, so getting back on on to Renegade, what was the the secret sauce, so to speak? Because that company, I think, in a lot of gamers' minds, went from, oh hey, Clank's really good, and oh wait, Honshu, oh yeah, I like Honshu a lot, and and to all of a sudden just this absolute explosion, or it certainly feels like an explosion of Renegade onto the scene with so many games in such a short period of time. What was the secret to that? Well, I think a lot of it is that we're not really a brand new company, even though we've only been around for three years under the Renegade brand. Scott has been in the industry for a very long time and is quite an expert at every aspect of running a business and marketing and everything that you need to do to be very successful. So he had all the finances figured out so that he could jump on the best games when he saw them and not have to pass. He knew how to get the word out and how to help coach me to do the marketing side of things. And he was able to get those games in front of the right people, work with distribution quickly, and actually produce them efficiently. So all of those things are not things you normally see in a very small startup company and are all really big challenges for just a one-man band. But because Scott's done this <laughs> several times before, he really had it figured out right from the start. So I would say the secret sauce is Scott. <laughs> Scott's secret sauce. That's right. <laughs> BJ from uh, Board Game Gumbo was curious, how do you guys find these games? How, how do you guys find the games that, that come into the line that you guys want to make, uh, make Renegade games? That sort of shifted when we started three years ago. That was something that Scott was just scouring the internet, looking for what people are excited about, talking to all of the designers that he had connections with from other previous companies. And he got really both lucky and was very smart to pick up a few real winners like Lanterns um, from Foxtrot Games. That was absolutely fabulous and really helped us out at the beginning. But after that, I think it helped that a lot of designers really appreciated the way that we work. So we have sort of a big focus on making sure that the designers are taken care of, that they get to be part of the process. And because he was so good to those people, they spread the word. And we definitely got some games like Lotus just because we had a pretty good reputation for being fun to work with. And that is not always the case. Like designers sometimes don't get a very good deal and we really want to make sure they did. So that helped. But also just getting out there and seeing what was popular. We went to several unpubs. Um, Scott actually this weekend is at a prototype event in Toronto. And going to events like that I think is great because you get to see some of the new stuff that isn't out there yet. Got it, got it, got it. By the way, if you hear me furiously scribbling, that, that has nothing to do with me taking notes on, on any of this stuff going forward. <laughs> Uh-oh, I should keep my mouth shut. <laughs> uh, BJ was also curious uh, specifically about, about Raiders, uh, Raiders of the North Sea, the Kennerspiel-nominated title that, uh, that you guys have some distribution of here in the U.S. Is that a one-time thing for Renegade, or is that something that, that we can expect more of, more of that, that sort of Euro crossover? in the future? 
Oh, I love Euro games. So the more of that we can do, the better. Um, actually, speaking of that, we have Kepler 3042 coming up. And it's an Italian game that I fell in love with after I picked it up at Essen last year. And that definitely is more of the Euro scene. And any of those that we find that just seem like they're really great games, we would likely pick up. And it's not that we're looking for any particular type of game at this point. We're just looking for really good ones. And that's kind of what we built our catalog around. On the marketing side of things, as, as I have quickly learned in my very first role as any sort of marketing anything on this side of things, there are more hats to that than I think people realize. As best as you can describe it, what, what is the role of someone who, who has that hat on as, as head of marketing for a company? Because I, again, I think some people might think of that as, well, you're just, you're just buying ads or you're just doing, uh, uh, sending out review copies or just doing uh, social media. But it's, it's that and a, and a lot more, at least, at least on my side of things. Is, is that true for you? Oh, definitely. I think that marketing really is just getting the word out to the right people in the right way. And that is different at every single tier of the industry. It's different for every game. It's different for everything that you think about. So you really have to strategize your entire marketing campaigns around your end goal and your end users. So that's something that takes a lot more to bite into than just let's buy some ads and throw some games out there and see what happens. And it really does take an organized strategy. I think Portal does a really good job of this. They are a company that I definitely keep an eye on because they do a really good job of organizing their strategy of far ahead of time and then executing on it. So it's, of course, getting information out there, but doing it in the right way is what's tricky. Look at what Portal's doing and then <laughs> copy what Portal's got it. Oh, okay. No. <laughs> Uh, Wade Mitchell was curious what your most effective marketing channel is. And, and he specifically asked, is YouTube the most effective marketing channel that you found? I will be perfectly honest. I have not done as much with YouTube as I should. It's on my plate for what I want to have done the next year. But I think that video is very important in our market right now. People seem to be moving that direction as internet speeds get fast enough and caught up to the point where you can actually stream video regularly. Internet plans on phones are a bigger deal and all of that technology is changing so quickly. And I think people just enjoy consuming video content. So it's certainly something to watch. Although I have not done it as much as I should, it's something that I am very interested in. I'm going to go tackle some qu Twitter questions while I think of more marketing questions and, and ideas to, to pick your brain about. Uh, Adam Dalton was curious, what's the biggest rules change to a game from the time designer submitted it? And, and the translation I'll put on that one is, what's the biggest change in a game you've seen from the time Renegade picked it up to the time it actually made it out onto the market? Oh, that is a tough question. I think that there are probably bigger ones that I'm not thinking of, but one that really I was involved in closely was actually Sentient, which just came out recently. And originally in that game, it was fabulous the moment that we played it, and I loved everything about it. But as we went through the development and played it a whole bunch, we noticed that the first player was a little bit weird because... There's three rounds in the game, and if you just rotate the first player in a four-player game, that fourth player doesn't get all the same options as the other three players do, which is a common problem and the reason why there's lots of weird first-player rules. So we messed with that a whole bunch and eventually came up with this rule where you can pass your turn, but it puts you on the lowest part of the totem pole for going first next round. And the reason we did it that way is because in this game, it's very strange. Sometimes going last is the best and sometimes going first is best. So giving players a chance to control when they're going to go in the next turn made it one more interesting choice during the game. Yeah, and passing also let you get rid of some cards in the row that were not advantageous for you. So it gave you this other benefit as well. No, that changed definitely. Uh, yeah, I can, I can tell that definitely made a difference as far as that game goes, no doubt about it. Adrian Dong was curious, does your role change if you guys are promoting a co-published game like one with Foxtrot? 
or one that's solely renegade? In other words, uh, is that interacting a lot with the other company? What's what's the process for that? Um, I wouldn't say it changes a lot. Like one thing that is great about working with Foxtrot is that they bring us beautiful, almost completely finished games and we do the publishing and marketing for them. So for me, it's not a lot different because we already are doing that for our own games and I treat their games just like my own baby, like I would with any of our own <laughs> games. So I love working with Foxtrot. And the only thing I would say that's different is that their games are just so polished that it's maybe a little bit easier. But <laughs> that's that's true with a lot of our games too. So the only thing that is maybe a little bit different when you're talking about either licensed or co-published games is that you do just want to check in and make sure everybody's on the same page. And that can just take an extra step, but it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's actually kind of nice a lot of times because it gives you a whole extra set of eyes to look at a piece of advertising you're thinking about putting out or something like that. So I love working with Randy at Foxtrot. Um, It's fabulous. Any project we do with him is great. So it, it really doesn't change my role that much, though. Kyle Kelly was curious, and and you were mentioning uh, all the games are like children, so I'm going to ask you to pick your favorite one. What's your favorite Renegade game and why? Oh, that's so unfair. (laughs) That's the question. I'm just passing it along. (laughs) Okay. I I wouldn't say I really have one favorite because I have enjoyed a lot of our games, but I will will say that there is one game that I got to produce this year, which was a really special treat for me um, when I started... About a year and a half ago, we went to an umpub and Scott and I were sitting down playing this game and I was so excited about it. I had all these ideas I wanted to do and he just turned to me and said, okay, this is yours. You get to do this all the way through. So I got to uh, work on the art of it as far as the art direction, finding an artist, working with them to make sure it was right. I got to work with the factory to get all of the right components set up and get a quote from them and every part of the process all the way through to the very end. And that game was sentient. So that's one that's a little bit near and dear to my heart just because I got to spend so much more time with it. But as far as picking one that I would put on the table in front of me right now, that would be a hard call. (laughs) Oh, she dodged the question a little bit, Kyle. I did (laughs) my best. (laughs) I, I did my best. It didn't it didn't quite work. No, but that sounds like a really cool experience, and, and it sounds like uh, Scott's setting you up to someday compete with him. That's uh, that's interesting. <laughs> I don't know about that. Maybe he just wants to retire someday. <laughs> Rook Games, brought to you by oh, no. Sarah Erickson. Oh, We're no. Calling it now. You. Here we go. Uh, Chuck, <laughs> the answer I thought might have come out would have been Clank, and we have gone pretty far in this interview without seriously talking about Clank, and that, that seems like a mistake, so let's fix that. Uh, <laughs> Josh, a.k.a. Ossian Gurr, says, and this is a direct quote this time, Clank in a dungeon, Clank underwater, Clank in space. Where does Clank go next? Clank on a plane? <laughs> I like the Clank on a plane plan, although we had not discussed that one previously. That's pretty hilarious. Um, no, we do have some other very big plans for Clank that I am super excited about, but unfortunately cannot share with you at this time. But I think everyone will very much enjoy it. But Clank in Space isn't even here yet, so I'm excited to take some time and really enjoy that over the next few months, especially going into the holidays. I think people, once they all get to have their hands on it, are really going to love the changes we made and sort of the extra stuff that makes it not a better experience than regular Clank, but a very different experience, which I think is hard to do, but definitely we were able to pull it off in this one. Based on that answer, I'm going to ask another question that I don't think is going to get an answer. Jimmy Miro was curious, when will we see the next expansion for, as he calls it, OG Clank, original original Clank? Next year. We got an, we got an answer of some sort. <laughs> and what might that expansion contain, Sarah Erickson? It will contain awesome stuff where you will want to avoid making noise. I'll give you that little hint there. <laughs> <laughs> There will be monsters, and they will get excited and try and attack you when you make noise. <laughs> I am calling this a scoop. We have gotten the scoop on the next Clank expansion. Uh, I can tell you it's going to be plane related, and it's going to involve not making noise. Uh, exclusive, just for your podcast. <laughs> just for my podcast, maybe forever, because <laughs> it may not be real. <laughs> <laughs> Some parts of that may or may not be real. <laughs> Thank you. 
perfect disclaimer for any. I can neither confirm nor deny that Space Clank, uh, or sorry, not Space Clank, uh, Plane Clank, Clank, Clank in, <laughs> Clank's on a plane, <laughs> Clank's is, on a plane. <laughs> is coming is coming soon to theaters slash retailers near you. <laughs> That's almost right. <laughs> Awesome. I, I would have to imagine that that the background as as a retailer has has made a huge difference in in what you've been able to do in terms of pushing Renegade's in store presence. Uh, I I know uh, from having watched it at work, uh, seeing the big flip ships event you guys had uh, had me being like, oh yeah, that looks like a really cool thing to do. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, it definitely gives me a different perspective than some other people have. And I also really appreciate that Scott Gator used to own his own store as well. So he really gets it when I want to do in-store programs. He usually has really good advice or comments about what we're trying to do. And I wish that more people in the industry were able to have that fantastic experience. And I'm also really lucky to still own my store so I can see what sort of community things are going on, what other publishers are working on, and how their programs are actually affecting my communities. So that's been fascinating. It's like having my own little research lab, which I miss a little bit from my days working as a scientist. So I just transfer all of that that energy into making my store my lab instead. Mm. So, so that scientific approach is kind of carried over and, and bled into the to the new life. Oh, absolutely! Yeah, I love doing experiments in our store with price changes and uh, counting the number of people who walk in the door at different times of the day, like that kind of stuff. Any data we can collect, I just eat that up. I love that stuff. I, I'm curious to ask because I was I was there working the booth and saw some of this. Um, the Gen Con experience this year was completely nuts at the Renegade booth uh, because we had Ex Libris and Space Clank and they were so unbelievably hot we had to physically guard the booth at different points to ensure to ensure folks didn't come in and just grab it. Uh, that was some insane times. Uh, from your perspective, how, how, was, how was Gen Con? Gen Con was awesome. The only regret I have is not getting to spend more time with all of those crazy fans. But other than that, it was just an amazing experience. It was super fun to see that much excitement about something that we've been working on for about a year. Um, Because we actually found Ex Libris at the exact same time we found Sentient. Like literally we were sitting there playing Sentient and J. Alex Caverne said, hey, you should really check out my buddy's game. And we turn around to the table behind us and that's where Adam P. McIver was with <laughs> Ex Libris. So we'd been working on both of those for quite a long time. And seeing that other people were as excited about those games as we were was very, very cool. And we spend so much time just sitting in our office working really, really hard in a dark room doing all of this number stuff that getting to spend time with people out in the wild is just really cool. Were you guys at all surprised by the, by the reaction and reception? <sighs> sort of a little bit. I don't know. You always n- have this sort of dread that as much as you promote and care about this game, that not everyone's going to feel that way. And for me, my mom's a librarian. I grew up in a house with books. So I knew that I was really excited, especially for Ex Libris. But I didn't know if I was the only one who felt that way. (laughs) So I was pretty sure it was going to be a hit after the first time we played it. It was just so clear that the mechanics were so fresh but familiar. And the way that Adam put everything together with all of the unique book titles... It just the whole package was really clean and wonderful. So I wasn't worried about it like I have been with some other games, but it was cool to see it all come together and have that much excitement. But it was also interesting, like, of course, Ex Libris and Klingon Space we knew would be pretty hot, but I was also really happy to see the fantastic reception of Scott Pilgrim's Precious Little Card Game and Raiders of the North Sea and uh, Flip Ships with King Clanko there demoing it for us and then you helping out. And of course, Sentient as well for me personally. It was fun to see everybody so excited about all of those games. I was so bummed we didn't have more copies of Flip Ships to sell through. I was so bummed about that. (laughs) And we brought a lot too. That's what's kind of crazy. I know. Oh, I know. I know it. Uh, (laughs) So not to not to to drive a further wedge or or uh, uh, help uh, help create the eventual. Uh, eventual rise of Sarah Erickson backed publisher Rook Games, a publishing company. <laughs> oh, where, no. where have you had your biggest I told you so moment with Scott? Oh, I don't know if I can think of any of those. Oh, man. 
There probably is one, but off the top of my head, it happens so rarely. He's a pretty smart guy. If you've spent any time with him, it's hard to catch him. Oh, 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 okay. Here's one. He'll laugh at this later. So when we're hanging out at these events, we're always walking around, going to dinner or whatever. And he is absolutely a gentleman. Like he's always opening doors for people and that kind of thing. And I really like to open doors for people too, because Montana is just a very friendly place. So I will often try and open the door for him and he grabs the door and makes me go through it first. And so I had to sit him down and say, hey, we are both cool people who are nice to each other. I get to hold the door for you sometimes too. But it's such like an old school thing that he should hold the door for me. He kind of had to take a step back and be like, oh, okay, you're right. <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is something that I could work on. So I very much appreciate that he did take a second to think about that and made a change. So that's cool. I think that's pretty neat. Uh, we, we got a Twitter question from, from uh, Scott. Why, why are you the enemy of fun? <laughs> so I I've gained that title for multiple different reasons. <laughs> but one particular story that is referenced often is that when I was writing my store, we had an F and M one night and these poor kids who had been sort of dumped there by their parents unfairly, were trying to make dinner for themselves out of the frozen pizzas I had in the <laughs> freezer. And so it was a, a brother and his uh, younger brother. So they come up to the counter and buy this pizza. I'm like, okay, but make sure that the older one of you is in charge of the microwave. Like, I don't want any problems. I want to make sure it goes well. So they go over there, and about 10 minutes later, I see smoke coming out of the oh, microwave. No. I run over there. It's a on fire pizza in the middle of my oh, FM. No. <laughs> I grab the microwave and run outside with it, billowing with smoke. And I turn around and I was unkind to the poor little kid saying, Why <laughs> why didn't you follow my instructions? Because he'd put the pizza in for like half an hour instead of for 30 seconds. So oh, he no. just starts bawling because it was actually his older brother who had done it for him and screwed up. <laughs> <laughs> but I definitely lost my cool there. And think of that when I'm dealing with uh, employees under high stress situations. <laughs> I try to remind myself not to yell at people. But that was that was one reason I make children cry. Is why, <laughs> why I'm the enemy Jeez. of fun. <laughs> oh, quite bad. <laughs> BGG user Alex Goldsmith has a question. If you were to start your own publishing company, what would be the name of that company? Oh, that's a good one. Um, that, that's tricky. So, okay, here's a here's an interesting thing. So I'm about to move to a new house. Um, my husband and I have been looking for somewhere with a little bit more out in Montana wilderness feel than the suburban home that we currently live in. And we just found one. We put an offer on it. And it's actually in the outlaw subdivision, which I find oh. hilarious because now Renegade Montana will be in the outlaw subdivision. So I'd probably go with that. <laughs> outlaw games. That's right. <laughs> That's pretty catchy. I think you can make that work. Yeah, not bad, right? And, and then you pair it up with the other slogan, outlaw games, we make children cry. We make children cry. The enemy of fun. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Can't beat that. <laughs> Oh man, oh man. Uh, so the, the one one last kind of broad topic I wanted to get into uh, had to had to do with with better diversity in in this wonderful hobby we we call ours. And and Renegade is actually a kind of a poster child for that because you guys have a ton of women on staff, a ton. That is true. That's another thing I've always really appreciated about working with Scott is that he is very careful just to find the very very best people for the job. And that doesn't mean he's out just only looking for women to hire on purpose, right. but he definitely has found people who were really excited about being recognized. And so far, that's just happened to be us women <laughs> are working there. But that certainly could change in the future. But I think that the important thing about diversity for me is that everybody is given a fair chance. And I feel like that definitely has happened at Renegade. I very much appreciate that. What What are some of the efforts that that are, are kind of being made? I'm sure, obviously, Renegade is is pretty conscious of that. And and in this in this hobby to 
to make it as as welcoming of a place as possible? I think just treating everybody the same and treating them all fairly. And I I don't think you need to really do anything more than that. But it has been tough. Like, of course, women haven't always been treated exactly the same and people with different abilities and races and all of that. So I think just recognizing that in our artwork, in our employees, all of that, everybody just needs to be felt like they're represented. So whether that's having more multicultural artwork or uh, whether it's hiring the right people, it's just all about making sure that it's all fairly represented. And I think we've we've tried to do that and have done a pretty good job. Yeah, I, I, I would say so. And, and I think being conscious of it is, is half the battle, I would have to think. Yeah, definitely. We actually have one really cool thing I'm kind of excited about. We're, we have a game coming out that we haven't announced quite yet, but it's about moving around in an area. And so each different person is represented by a meeple on the board and they're all moving around. And we thought it would be really cool to have these meeples not just be amorphous blobs on the board, but really feel like people could connect with them. So we posted a picture of this on Twitter and Instagram recently, but basically all the meeples are very different than what you would normally see. One is like with crazy hair, another one is in a wheelchair, and we've just got a bunch of different things that almost anybody could relate to looking at these meeples. And it's not that you know, we need to make one for every single person that exists ever. But it's just nice to have some different ones to choose from. So I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, I I just saw, I just went and looked at that myself. And uh, yeah, that's really cool. Really cool. Awesome. (laughs) All right. We're into the the backstretch. We're into the home stretch here. And uh, of course, the the fun questions have to come out. So uh, the first one came from Beth Sobel, who was asking about the difference between a miniature yak and a dachshund wearing horns <laughs> so i was at grand con recently which was a fantastic regional convention in grand rapids michigan and it was really fun to be able to go to an event like that because beth sobel was there um richard lanius uh david waybright from man versus meeple just a lot and tom vassal and z garcia a lot of really amazing people at this fairly small convention So I actually got some time to sit down and chat with her, which is something I wouldn't be able to do at a bigger event like Gen Con. And she and I were talking about this this new house that I'm moving into and how much my husband wanted to have a Tibetan yak as a pet now. (laughs) (laughs) And I was describing them to her as uh, sort of like a dachshund cow mix mutated creature thing so she drew one for me and it was very adorable (laughs) (laughs) she is a fantastic artist i can imagine that would have come out pretty well she really is yeah she and i were playing atlas together which is a game that she just did illustrations for for us and it turned out absolutely beautifully so we were talking about fantastic creatures including the Tibetan yak and the horned dachshund, which unfortunately have not yet made it into any games, but maybe in the future. <laughs> Someday, maybe sometime soon. That's right. That one actually had me think of a, of a more serious question, and, and it's how do you deal with, with negative feedback? When a game gets negative feedback or you see negative feedback in the community or whatever the case may be, how, how does that hit you? I mean, what kind of effect does that have on a publisher? Well, I think the important thing is that we make games that are for everyone, but also the games that we make, uh, every one of the games that we have is for somebody. And even if one particular reviewer or one group of gamers didn't like this game, that's totally fine because we have a whole bunch of other games that they probably will absolutely love and there will be other people who really do love that game. And we've never had a game that was just universally hated and I think there really aren't a lot of those out there because there's a reason why somebody made this game, played it with their friends, introduced it to a publisher. There's a reason why all of those things worked out to be ending in a published game. So sure, we have some negative feedback. I think it hurts the designers more than it hurts us usually. They can take it pretty personally. But for me, I've been around a lot enough that I just sort of let it roll off and then focus on the good parts because somebody out there is really enjoying that game. I think that's a good way to keep perspective. All right, I have one final question. And this is the final question I ask every guest on Holding Court. Sarah. If you could be any flavor of ice cream, what flavor would you be and why? 
<laughs> Definitely mint chocolate chip because mint is delicious and fresh and nice and cold and exciting. And those little chocolate chips that are in mint ice cream give it a little bit of spark. So okay. I love mint chocolate chip ice cream. And that would be that's your that's your ice cream persona. Yeah, yeah, I think that works pretty well. And and because it's green, that's pretty important. <laughs> is that is that the preferred slash only player color? So that's another funny story. Uh, I do really like playing green as a player color, and it's kind of nice. I think most people have a color that they usually pick so that they can remember which player they are on the board more easily. And Scott knows that I always play green, so he made sure that when he was talking to Direwolf about Clink in Space that they made sure there were no green player colors options in that whole game <laughs> just because of me. <laughs> Very spiteful, but that's okay. <laughs> as, a, so, yes. as a player who prefers green myself, and knowing that Sean, also on the podcast, prefers green, keep fighting for green. Sarah. I will. I will. Yep. I'm going to pull all of the green player pieces out of regular Clank and play them in Space Clank just to get back at him. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> although, although I'd have to imagine thematically that the adventurers are going to be like, "What? What? What is this? What is this devilry?" Like, <laughs> probably yeah. be an awkward place to be dropped into. The sword or whichever one the green player has in regular Clank might not be very effective against the space creatures in Clank in space. <laughs> but that's okay. We could get past that. <laughs> he might fit in just fine on, on Clank's on a plane. Yeah, that's right. A sword? That would work. We could have that. Yeah. <laughs> as long as you can get it by TSA. That's, uh, that's the tricky part, I think. That is tricky. <laughs> well, I'll have to do some research and figure out how to make that happen. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sarah, thank you so much. This was an absolute delight. Uh, where, If folks want to reach out and say hi and chat and, uh, and try and get secret information about Renegade Games or how to best market games in general or your future publisher, Outlaw Game Studios, uh, <laughs> what would be the best way for them to do so? If you want to contact me either on at Play Renegade on Twitter or Play RGS on Facebook or Renegade underscore games underscore studios at Instagram, I would love to chat with anyone who would like to send me a message. Perfect. You heard that. Anyone, absolutely anyone, send right. messages. Send a ton of them. Sarah, thank <laughs> you so much. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for having me. This was a blast.